it's such a high stress job. Like when I first started doing it, I loved it. And yeah. you're like, oh man, this is a great job. But like I told my boss, I said, he's like, how are you liking the job? And I said, dude, like, it's great. You're paying me great money to drive around all day, listen to radio, stop about 15 to 20 times and do something for like 10 minutes and yeah. then keep driving. Like yeah. pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. It uh, but then the back. You, it does hurt the back. I got back problems. Yeah. But when you, when you start factoring in the, the stress level of driving, you know, 80,000 pounds down the highway, and you're you're going down slow, so making sure you don't burn your brakes out. You got people who are cutting you off left and right in Philadelphia, and like you're you're responsible for their well being. They make yeah. stupid decisions, but if you kill them, it's on you. Yeah. And so like it's just it's a high stress job. And uh, you're I, a weapon I, of mass destruction on the road. Very much, yeah. very much. Uh, it, it's just you know that that's why a lot of these truckers like I. I there was a there was a trucker that that literally died in the truck like he just had a heart attack and died in the truck that i worked with another mm. guy got cancer and didn't make mm. it to his retirement and like i just saw the guys you know dropping like flies as they got older and i was like i can't i can't do this like that like i, I gotta find a way out of this yeah. <laughs> like, it's a brutal and, uh, life yeah it really is it's it a really free is. life it, there's a lot of freedom to it but it's brutal um it, it, yeah when you can you tell us what the one time you pulled your gun out uh, yeah, last I think it was no, last November. Um, we we were shooting a documentary that hasn't been released yet, so this will be in a future documentary. Uh, next year it will come out at some point, and uh, it's a long story as to how we got to. It's like one of those things where you start in the beginning of the movie. And it's like let me tell you how I got here, and you next spend two hours <laughs> finding. Uh, but long story short, we shot a documentary, and it had to do with us uh, hunting down the dog man through Kentucky, the idea of portals, ancient caves with portals opening up in it with dog man activity in the area. We came down here into Tennessee. We went to uh, my late great friends, uh, uh, Scott Carpenter, his location where he filmed a portal open up behind him. He had a rig that he carried on him. It was like a gimbal that always shot behind him. He had this thought that like once you pass, that's when they ha there's activity happening. So he had a gimbal that kept the camera steady and he was walking behind and there's Genius. this portal opened up in the Smoky Mountains and you can see something standing inside the portal. Um, and so like we went to that area and then we went down to another area that he often researched and he wouldn't go at night. He wouldn't go here at night. Uh, he, he had a lot of interaction in this location. He wouldn't do it at night. And we're the crazy boys and that's what we do. So we go out at night and we see what we can bump into. <laughs> so the whole, so we go out and, uh, this first, the first part of the trip, we did all this stuff. We all go home and we felt like we, there was there, we left something on the table. We didn't know what it was. We're just like, it just needs a little salt, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we rounded up some of the guys who were available and we went back out for one more night. And I took them down to where Scott did all his research that he wouldn't go at night. And we had some things happening uh, throughout the night. I wouldn't say it was major stuff. And then it was probably about two, two o'clock in the morning around that time, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. And we're, we're cooked. I had an upper respiratory infection before I went out that day. My wife looked at me. She's like, you know, once you're done with this, like your body's going to crash and you're going to crash hard. And I was like, I'll be fine. I crashed for like a week. I thought I was going to die. And I'm out there and it's cold out and I'm breathing in this cold air and I'm coughing and I'm sneezing and, you know, swallowing your mucus. And it, it's late. And we're con contemplating packing it up. We're just like, it, it's dead and I'm, I'm dying. And I go over to Joel and I said to him, hey, man, listen, if I go out, we, we, like, if we go out together, you want to go out one more time? And he said, yeah. So uh, him and I set off and we start walking out. And we go down to a spot that earlier in that day, my friend Brian had scouted the area for us earlier. And he was on his motorcycle and he came down into this valley where there's water that had uh, gotten built up. Uh, some would call it a puddle. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he, he slammed on his brakes because he saw this large canine print in the mud. And this thing, he took a picture of it to give you size comparison. And anybody who's familiar with like skull, skull cans, this thing dwarfed a skull can. Mm. And, uh, there's not supposed to be wolves in, in East Tennessee, even though we, we have them on game trail cam. That's another story. Um, so he casts it and he shows it to us that night. He comes out with us, shows that he bails, he leaves. So me and Joel go down to this spot. We're like, Hey, let's just go down there see what we can find. When we get down there, we notice that there's a trail going off on both sides of the trail we're on. 
And we're like, man, this thing must have came out, stepped here, and went down that way. So we set off that way. We went through the woods down this small trail, and it took us all the way down to this river. We didn't get anything, nothing. We came hiking back out. We started going down the other trail, but it was so overgrown. We were like, one, it's going to take forever. Two, it's clearly nothing sizable came rushing through here anytime recently. So we go back on this main trail. We're hiking back to base camp. And we're just thinking, okay, it's night. And we see this one other trail that we're like, oh, we haven't seen that before. We start going on. As soon as we go into this trail, we start smelling this smell that we smelled in Washington, this musty smell. Mm -hmm. this, but it would, it would come in on us and then leave. Like, we're, like it would just come and go. And it wasn't Weird. a windy day. Hmm. So it happened like two or three times, and all of a sudden I got sick to my stomach. I think I was swallowing too much mucus, and I felt like I was going to hurl. Hmm. So I stopped the hike. I got down on my knee. Now I'm filming. Uh, the only thing we have is a night vision camera that I'm holding with my hand, and I'm filming myself. And uh, I, it's on like a handheld tripod. And so I, I, I lean over, and I'm just like kind of trying to get my breath about me. And... I set up the tripod facing me, so I'm squatted down, and I have it looking at me. So the night vision camera is looking at me. We're completely lights out, completely dark, can't see a thing. And so we're sitting there, and we're just kind of like being quiet. And I said, let's just be quiet and just listen. And we start hearing movement off in the wood line behind the camera. So the camera's between me and whatever's moving. And we both hear it. And I think Joel hit the lights and, and shine. We don't see nothing. And I stand up. So now all you're seeing on camera because I stood up is like from my torso down. You're not even seeing my chest or my head. Um, I'm not a cinematographer. You know, that's what we have the cinematographer for. But he, we left him at base camp. Uh, and so we're, we're just kind of listening. And you're, you're watching me. And on my camera is a shotgun microphone. Wesley can attest to this. So shotgun microphones are very uh, specifically designed to capture what's right in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so... You're hearing me talk very fine. And I'm talking about hearing something behind the, the camera, which theoretically you shouldn't be able to hear very well, if at all. So we're standing there, and about 20 seconds later, all of a sudden you hear something bipedal rush us. It's like, choo, 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 choo. and uh, it, it was coming in fast and it was loud. And so we, I, we yell, I, I own holster my gun, I point. And all of a sudden, this thing runs up and stops right behind my camera, right behind. It's ran right up on us, and we don't see a stinking thing, man. It's wow. there, there's absolutely nothing that we can see. And I'm pointing my gun at something I just can't see, but I we we both heard it run up on us, and it's right there. And you actually see me in camera step to the side because I swear this thing was going to blow through us. Wow. And so we, we that happens. And then like 20, 30 seconds later, you hear this yell off behind us. And I'm just like, what? Whoa, you know, like skin crawl, you know? Mm -hmm. And when the first rush came in on us, they heard it back at base camp. They heard us yell. Wow. And they ran us in and they're like, you guys good? And we're like, yeah, we're good. And they, they, they thought we were pranking. And so when they heard that yell, they're like, you guys are, you're playing games. Like, we ain't playing games. I'll pick up the camera. It's time to roll. Like, I'm like, <laughs> I can't see what just ran up on me and something's yelling off behind me. I'm yeah. getting out of here. That's you know? wild. And so we start hearing all this yelling happening behind us and stuff as we're leaving. Uh, we go back and we analyze the footage and I thought for sure it's, it's going to be a nothing burger because the microphone wasn't pointing that way to give you this understanding. Literally the shotgun microphone still picked up the bum rush that came up behind and behind wow. it. Like, you can actually hear it go. Doo, 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 nice. running and so I was like, there's the salt. Yep. That's the salt we needed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, wow. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a wild night, but um, yeah, I was glad I had that 10 millimeter. If I would have saw what I was aiming at, I probably would have pulled the trigger. I'm I'm pretty much of the mindset that if these things are are out there, then kill them. I wonder so, if I wonder if you blow one's brains out, others appear right after and how only one way to find out <laughs> that's right that is right tony <laughs> listen man uh, like listen like there's a lot of boring ways to die and there's some really cool ways to die yeah so like you just gotta make sure you get it on camera though <laughs> well I, yeah and hopefully the camera survives the yeah, incident you gotta die on camera tony because like that's 
That's what people I'm want, okay. right? I'm okay by it. Whatever happened to that guy, Tony Merkel, that had that podcast? The, the highly su successful, amazing podcast, The Confessionals. Whatever happened to that? Well, he died hunting monsters. Well, let's show shot you this one in the face, and it started it's running at you. Just be like, hold on, let me live stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you got to make sure you live stream it too. One second, please. <laughs> the camera doesn't have to survive. Um, well, before we let you go, I was wondering if you could tell us how how best you you do it and others could do it preparing children your own children for the spiritual warfare that they'll be inheriting hedge of protection of prayer over them is your literal foundation starting point you can't you can't make your kids believe what you believe mm -hmm. you can't we you, you see you see throughout history people who are raised in strict households religious households that rebel against it because it's bull crap a lot of times uh, the, the, the ones that are the most strict are also the most flawed and the kids don't see the grace that the parents t say that it's, that's supposed to be in existence. Yeah. So like you, you can, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. So when it comes to raising kids, I think the best thing you can do from day one, or as soon as day one happens for you and your, your salvation process is to bathe, not only your kids, your household, your wife, your husband, your spouse over in prayer and pray for their salvation pray for their spiritual protection pray for their physical protection and it's it, it, it might sound goofy to some people but it's i think it's important to pray over your property pray over your house pray over the land that your house sits on pray that god sends his angels to protect your family and your property that nothing can penetrate uh and and to do that on the regular i think that's the launching pad and then what you're doing is you're taking yourself out of the equation and allowing literally the almighty God to do what the almighty God does. Yeah. And it no longer is your responsibility for your kids' uh, salvation. It's a, it's a literal uh, them with God thing, and you're just there to be the, the guide to the water. Yep. Uh, and, and I think that's probably the best thing we can do. And it's not going to go pretty every time. I don't think like I have two kids. My son is six. He's going to be seven. And my daughter's three going to be four in August. And when my son was four brother, like my son, he, like, I don't even know when he came to salvation. Like, like he, it's like he was born this way. Like he doesn't understand the idea that somebody could not believe in a God. Mm -hmm. He doesn't. And like, I wasn't the best, like I wasn't the best at, at like rate. I feel like I wasn't the best at raising my kids in a spiritual household. Like, I mean, I, I'm a Christian and I talk about it and stuff, but like, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like I could have done better. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, it just seems like the kid always just believed and just like, like he just is confused by the idea that, you wouldn't think that there could be, there could, there, there could, there, that there's not a God and yeah. like all this stuff. And I try to explain to him that some people don't think that way. And he's just like, why? And he's always been that way. Now, my daughter, <laughs> my daughter, uh, she's going to be four. And, you know, he'll say to her, like, you know, uh, God doesn't really like it when you do that. And she's like, I don't believe in God. He's like, what? <laughs> like, he gets so, he's like, what are you talking about? You know? And so like, as the dad in the situation, I just tell him, like, Hey man, you, like she's, she's got her own thing. And, 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 you know, like, we just got to be patient, you know? But, but like, I, I think that's the best thing that we can do as parents is just to, to take it out of our hands mm -hmm. and just pray and let God run with it because it's ultimately something that they have to decide for themselves. Yeah. Uh, between them and God. So totally. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it's but totally I, agree. You said your daughter's turning four in August? Yeah. My daughter's yeah. turning four in August. Oh, what day? Yeah, uh, the 14th. Oh, my daughter's the 30th. Oh, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Cool, that's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, how much do you tell them or do they know about the things we talk about? Like, do you get into that kind of stuff at all? Yeah, I, I, I probably got into it too much with Ben. Um, like, he. he <laughs> that's how I feel about I, my son, too. Like, whoops, <laughs> he went a little too deep. Yeah, like he he talks about Nephilim like it's a cheeseburger. Like he's just like like he's, he talks about Nephilim and he's like like uh, I said to him that I was coming in I was coming in here to do this. I said I have to go to work, you know, and he's like and he the first thing he says, not oh, are you interviewing somebody or what what are you doing at the office? Are you going to the office? He's like, "Oh, are you going to go sleep in that cave?" Like that's like that's <laughs> that at my house. Like 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 my, my son thinks that, you know, That's like that amazing. is Indiana Jones. And yeah. so he, like, he knows the yeah. trips that I go on. He knows I hunt these monsters. I've just, I, I've been kind of brutally honest with him. And I don't yeah. know why I probably should have shielded him from it, but like, he knows I go out and do, do these things. And I yeah. think it's just been normalized for him. I know. Uh, he's he's same. gonna be weird. Same. My weird. kid was in class and the, the teacher was like, what does your dad do? And he goes, he writes about monsters. And they're like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> well, it's true. 
King. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Um, well, man, it is always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Somewhere on TimCast.com is our original conversation. It's behind the paywall there, but that was the first time we met in person, and it was a great, great conversation. And uh, you can also find the confessionals. How do people find the confessionals on YouTube? Where? Uh, yeah, just look it up. The confessionals. Uh, we're on YouTube. Uh, we just broke that hundred thousand subscriber mark on Wednesday. Uh, you, we're also on podcast playing apps. That's where I kind of started before I even cared about YouTube. Uh, you can look us up the confessionalspodcast.com. And if you want to email us some crazy experiences that you've been, and you want to talk to me about it on the show, uh, go ahead and email us. There's a contact page on the website, or you can just go uh, contact at the confessionalspodcast.com. And, uh, you know, we'll get back to you. Where can people it find you? Good. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me. I hang out on Instagram a lot and increasingly in political environments on X. So uh, <laughs> at oh, Tony man. underscore Merkel on X and Tony Merkel official on Instagram. Uh, I'm around. You can find me. It's uh, all parapolitics. Parapolitics, man. Like that's that's my excuse. Because like, I, I mean, listen, if people are saying that to you, what do you think they say to me? I mean, I've been doing this for seven years and <laughs> stuff. And like, I tune in to hear about Bigfoot, not Donald Trump's opinion. <laughs> you know, like, but I'm like, listen, like, like there, there's, there's a real there's a real marriage here though and i always told people years ago i said the higher you get in the conspiracy realm the closer it gets to the paranormal they do merge uh it, it, it's that it's that pyramid you know yes, uh yes, yes. but so i mean like to to ignore that and to present pretend, pretend that equation doesn't exist is just being dishonest so yes. uh, the higher you go up in these conspiracies the more you find the satanist the more you find the 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 child abuse and th that does spawn spiritual interaction because when people are doing things to children like that there is a real demonic force behind that those actions they are being guided by demons and a lot of times it's because they summon them that's who they worship yep. and so the, the more you understand that the more you see it all kind of comes together yep the, the, the demons are feeding off our suffering but especially the suffering off the innocent and the children yes. and uh yeah that must be destroyed so tony till next time i appreciate it everyone check out the confessionals find tony online he's the best uh we'll talk soon dude Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, always a pleasure.